And there was a recent study this week that came out where young people talked about why they no longer even bother to use voicemail, because it takes too long. <laughs> but think about that for a second. The nature of human communication is changing. For those of us who are a bit older, who are uncomfortable, for example, with email as a form of communication, which is an impersonal form of communication where you cannot express the emotion or feelings behind something. Think about the challenges of an email communication, if you will, versus an in-person conversation or over the phone. And then think about a short text message, a burst of text or a burst of text on a Facebook relationship. That's all that's going on. That's changing the nature of, of interaction and communication. How we educate young people is being transformed because of this new technology, for better and for worse. They have shorter attention spans. Many of them sit in class and look down at their cell phones underneath their desk instead of paying, not you guys there, I realize that, <laughs> but, but uh, instead of paying attention to their teacher. With my, with my large lecture class at Stanford, I have to face the challenges of whether or not I can give the same kind of exams since sh polls show that one out of three teenagers today admit that in some form or another they've either cheated on, on an assignment or plagiarized an assignment due to the new media, the, the, the technology available to them, in a way. So it's transforming an educational classroom, both negatively but also positively because of the opportunities. It's obviously transformed our political system. Think about the way that President Obama ran his campaign and the extraordinarily effective use he made of the new media platform, actually under the leadership of Julius Janikowski, who's going to be the new chairman of the FCC. Or the news conference he had last week, where he did an online news conference with the American people, taking questions back and forth. That would have been something we would never have thought of five years ago, let alone 20 years ago in American political, di political dialogue. So it's changing the nature of our political system, allowing much greater participation by the average citizen, allowing politicians in many cases to bypass some of the traditional structures and reach out directly to voters and others who are concerned. It's also changing, I believe, how we define ethics and norms in our society. At Common Sense, we work closely with Professor Howard Gardner at the Harvard School of Education, who's famous for his theory of multiple intelligence. And he cites issues now that are raised in terms of the education and development of our young people that media presents. First of all, I'll give you some examples. How it's reshaping the nature of personal identity. When you're forming your identity online in a Facebook or MySpace page where you can make up who you are in whatever way you want, as young people, particularly teenagers, are want to do. It's changing the way that young people interact and socialize. They ask each other out over Facebook. That's how they plan their parties. That's how they plan their social engagements. And oftentimes, it, they will spend four or five hours a day communicating that way, rather than hanging out with each other in person. Anonymity is an enormous challenge from an ethical standpoint in a new media world, because you can post and say anything without consequences in an anonymous world. That is what has led to the phenomenon that we know as cyberbullying. Many of you are familiar with the case of the mom who went on MySpace and posed as a teenager and then cyberbullied another teenager, which led to that child's suicide. Now, that is just one horrific example of, of a phenomenon that we see virtually all kids face today in some form or another, which is anonymous postings and textings, let alone this, the self-revelatory stuff that children will do online today. Over 22% of young people say today that they have posted nude or semi-nude pictures of themselves online. Again, because the world has opened up and changed so dramatically and they may not have all of their faculties and judgment that they'll get later, it's, a fairly tr it's, a, it's an example of how people will experiment with, with presenting themselves to the world that can have significant consequences. The concept of personal privacy for all of us has changed because of the web. All of our privacy has been changed as a result. And how about the concept of credibility and trustworthiness? How do you know what's real or not real when it's on the internet? It's no longer sourced. It's obviously had an enormous ch impact on the, the whole area of journalism in the United States. But the fundamental ethical under issue underneath is credibility and trustworthiness of sources, since people can and do say and post anything on the web. The bottom line is that this new media reality will affect all of us, but most specifically how our kids grow and thrive 
and whether we leave them a better life and a better future. And therefore, we must be involved with their lives and with this new media reality, no matter what age we are, because this is about our kids and our country's future. So what do we do about it? Let's talk about the four different institutions that have real opportunity to do something about it. First, our government. I believe there's an important role for the government at both the federal and state and local level to be involved in this. We ought to be investing in media education and specifically digital media education in every school in the United States. There ought to be a program like DARE or Driver's Ed in every school, K through 12 school from kindergarten on up that educates teachers, parents, as well as the kids about the realities of this new media environment. And we ought to create at a time of economic uncertainty when many of my students at Stanford and in colleges and universities around the country are worried about where they're going to get a job, a new digital teacher core, where people with young people who are familiar with the technology, who are the true natives of this digital age, much more than we adults are, will go into schools and teach the ethics and norms of digital behavior and digital education in every school here in Cleveland, the state of Ohio, and across the United States. The government also has an important role in regulating the excesses of things ranging from monopolies and concentration of media power in a few hands to setting rules about what content is appropriate in reasonable time, place, and manner. That's the old rules that we think about in terms of the family hour and stuff like that. Time and place and manner have changed in the media because of the ability to watch and listen and surf at basically any time you want. But there's still an overall system that we could, that, that, that um, framework that, that thoughtful government leadership can provide without veering into the area of censorship. We can invest in research. With all of this new media technology out there, with kids spending hours and hours a day on cell phones and Facebook and MySpace, we need to research what that does to their brains. We need to research the positive and negative health impacts and educational impacts of all that. And, and we ought to and, and the and, and we ought to invest in that research to translate it into future educational gains. You can't just talk about the role of government, obviously, in this though. You need to also talk about the role of industry. I don't think that the media industry can view its role, the media and technology industries today can view their roles in the growth of these extraordinary digital challenges that we face without taking responsibility for their piece of the pie. They need to provide consumers and parents with easy to use information and tools so that you can know more about what your kids are consuming um, and so that you can make better choices about whether it's appropriate or not appropriate. For example, you ought to be able to go on a YouTube page and know, YouTube page and know if that's okay for your 13-year-old who's doing a homework assignment or not. We have the technology and the wherewithal to do it, but only private industry can invest in that kind of capacity. We need the, uh, the industry as well to provide ethical and, and responsible kids' content on their platforms and to think long and hard about the kids who are all on these various audiences, whether it's cell phone companies, whether it's the traditional movie and television companies, or it's the Googles and Facebooks who have the hundreds and hundreds of millions of young people who use their services. And finally, we need business to invest themselves in the educational opportunities of the internet, to not just look at that as a government or family or school prerogative, but in fact to see that they have a role in making sure that the educational opportunities are taken advantage of by everyone. Parents and grandparents obviously are the front line of defense, and I think you can't parent today without doing your homework and being aware of the impact that media has on your children. You have to set limits. When we get into the question and answer period, I'm sure that some of you will ask for specific guidelines about what parents can do. But there are obvious things that every parent can do to limit their kids' exposure to a reasonable amount and to make sure that they, that they balance their media consumption with other healthier activities. And finally, I think at the end of the day, what this really speaks to is the importance of citizens becoming involved in this area because it's affecting all of our lives. You know, 50 or 60 years ago, the environment in our society here in Cleveland faced major challenges, whether it was the pollution of lakes and rivers, whether it was our air, whether it was our broader physical environment or the depletion of our natural resources. 